Hello, Endeavor here. So we're back for another stream on Morgoth and Endeavor's classic movies. And this is our 10th stream that we're doing in this series. So we're going to be doing something a bit different for this one. We're going to be comparing and contrasting two different movies. So the first one is a classic from the 60s. It's Bonnie and Clyde, which you most likely will have heard of. Many of you will probably have seen it. And it's based on the legendary crime duo Bonnie and Clyde from the 1930s. The second film we're going to be talking about is almost like the the response to that film. It's it's like the yin and yang of two, two, two different films that kind of fit together in, in that way. And it's called The Highwaymen. It's a Netflix movie from 2019, which, uh, what you know, we'll get into this later, but surprising it was made by Netflix. But it's about the Texas Ranger, Frank Hamer, who hunted down Bonnie and Clyde when they were on their infamous uh, crime spree in the 1930s. So these films almost like match to each other, uh, like a yin and yang. And the, the themes are really interesting. They're almost like the complete opposite. But we'll get into that. But what I'll do first is I'm going to, I'll first I'll say hi to Morgoth. How are you doing, Morgoth? Hello there. It's great to be back. It's really nice that this little cozy series that we we started about a year ago is uh, hitting hit hit its tenth is tenth like episode tenth stream. And I'm glad we did, we we did this. It's a nice sort of break from all of the usual misery and stuff. Yeah, as someone on Twitter said, I actually have a conspiracy theory on Bonnie and Clyde. I said we're not going to be getting into this. This is where we, this these streams are where we take a break from conspiracy theories. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm going to give a short history of Bonnie and Clyde um, for anyone who doesn't know who they are. So I'll go I'll go on for a few minutes to explain the history, then we'll get into the films. So they're an infamous crime duo from the from 1930s Texas. Uh, Clyde Barrow was born in 1909. He was a small time crook, uh, specializing in auto theft, robbery, and was regularly arrested. While Bonnie Parker was born in 1910, she was a uh, she, she was married in her teenage years, but then separated from her husband. And she worked in a, a diner in Dallas and dreamed of fame and celebrity. So the two of them met in 1930, uh, and Clyde was arrested shortly after for um, for robbery. And the I guess the first crime that she was involved with him in was that she actually broke him out of prison in 1930 by smuggling a gun into prison, which he used to escape. Uh, but he was arrested again and then released in 1932. Uh, so the two reunited after his release, and they went on an infamous two-year-long crime spree, which took them across several different states. Their, uh, their method of committing crime was usually car theft, so stealing different cars, uh, changing license plates, uh, they're, be they're best known for robbing banks. They're known as these infamous bank robbers, but in reality, they actually specialized in robbing gas stations and grocery stores. In their two years, I think they only met, robbed maybe about 10 banks or so, but many, many more uh, you know, small-time robberies than that. Uh, and they were, they were originally called the Barrow Gang, but the, the, the famous, phrase, uh, famous title, Bonnie and Clyde, was applied to them after... There was these photographs and poetry that was discovered at one of their hideouts and printed in the newspaper. So there's these famous photos of Bonnie Parker with a cigar in her mouth, even though she didn't smoke cigars, and a, a pistol with her leg up against a car, and a picture of her with holding a BAR and pointing it at Clyde, and uh, all these like uh, re these really like um, rebellious, r really um, edgy photos that they took together. And then she wrote poetry about their adventures. And all this was pu published in the newspaper, and they kind of became these uh, almost folk heroes. That, like that, this is where their whole legend comes from. And they are really more a, lo a lot more legend than they are actual. Um, th than a lot of the than a lot of in the media made them out to be, because it's actually not even confirmed whether or not Bonnie Bonnie Parker actually ever killed anyone herself. It's debatable uh, whether she did. There was one report that she had shot a police officer in the head while he was lying on the ground. But that was actually disproven. But anyway, uh, so they were uh, a media sensation in their time. And there was a former Texas Ranger who came out of retirement named Frank, ha Frank Hamer. Uh, he was a legend. So he had uh, over 20 years, over th almost 30 years of, of law enforcement experience. And he, was kind he, he became a Texas Ranger towards the end of the days of what we would call 
the Wild West. And I know the, like the Wild West is also a lot, a lot of myth surrounding it. But back in the days when there still were, you know, big shootouts, there still were, there still was uh, skirmishes on the border with Mexico with different gangs and and such. You know, you, what you think of as the the cowboy, he was at the he was at the very end of that. And he retired a couple of years earlier, but was brought out of retirement to hunt down Bonnie and Clyde. And uh, they, he eventually caught them. So on May 23rd, 1934, Hamer and five other officers uh, set up a ambush for them. So they had the accomplice of one of, uh, he had one of Clyde's accomplices father uh, park his truck on the side of the road and hope that Clyde would slow down the car to help him. So the Hamer and his five men were hiding in the bush. And when Clyde just slowed down the truck, they jumped out and fired 130 rounds into the car, killing both Bonnie and Clyde instantly. Uh, and basically they've been a, a folk legend ever since. So we're going to be talking about two different films. One of them is the 1967 film called Bonnie and Clyde, which is focused on the, the crime duo. Released in the 60s, uh, it was released during the counterculture, and it was an icon of kind of the 60s, the 60s left, the counterculture revolution, and The Highwaymen, which was, of course, released very recently, and it's based on Frank, and it's focused on Frank Hamer and his partner, Manny Galt. So I guess we'll start with, um, well, I guess I'll, 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 get, I'll get Morgoth in first. So is there anything you want to say to open uh, with about like the legend or about any of the two films? So to start with, is there anything you want to say? Not really. I think you, you summed up the legend pretty well there. Um, I think we should just jump into the the 67. And the first thing that came to my mind, because I'd seen it before, a long time ago, and the first thing that jumped out at me was just how sexy Faye Dunaway is. Like, real, real classic Hollywood uh, beauty. She, she just kind of oozes sex. Like, everything, just the way she looks... And both of the uh, the the actors, Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway, like they are both like so charismatic in, in this movie. You can really see Hollywood at its peak, I think. It's 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 like she's she's sexy and charismatic, but in a really sophisticated way, like the little look out of the corner of the eye and everything. And you you just you just can't take your eyes off uh, Faye Dunaway. And and Warren Beatty's great as well. Uh, so, so it it just, it's it's a real, real classy movie. Even if you know we're going to have a kind of pop at some of its subversive elements, uh, it, it's it's a very it's a very good film, I think. Yeah, so it was an icon of the 1960s counterculture. Uh, it was released a year before the Hayes Code was officially abandoned, but it was really no longer in effect. And the film was controversial upon its release. I mean, it would be it would be considered modest by today's standards, but um, it was controversial upon its release because it broke a lot of the former guidelines, which had been uh, which film studios avoided breaking during the time of the Hayes Code. So, for example, uh, things that weren't allowed in films, uh, you know, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s were uh, criminality, uh, well, glorification of criminality illicit sexuality, extreme violence, uh, a lot of blood. And Bonnie and Clyde basically smashes all of that. It's a he it heavily romanticizes the the couple of the outlaw, uh, the outlaw lovers. And, you know, one thing I thought of is, you, you mentioned Faye Dunaway, is that she definitely, in this film, is a product of the 1960s. I mean, she's a, she's a beautiful woman. I definitely agree with that. But she doesn't look like Bonnie Parker at all. She looks like she's from the 1960s. Like, her hairstyle is completely 60s it's not 1930s at all but uh you know st still it's still a great uh performance nonetheless uh and you definitely see that the um that it was in tune with a lot of the uh social movements that were going on at the time so like for example the sexual liberation movement uh bonnie and, and clyde are an unmarried couple uh, heavily heavily sexualized rebels and um you know it's a definitely a, a big theme in the film i mean the first the opening scene is of a naked Bonnie Parker daydreaming in her bedroom. So you definitely can tell that they were really in tune with a lot of the uh, the social movements that were going on at the time. And the 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 she's kind of behind the bars on her, her bed and she's kind of tapping them as if to say like, this is my prison. I'm trapped in a prison and I need to get out there and I need to live my life. I need to be uh, emancipated from this tawdry, boring existence. 
So, like, straight away, you, you've you got, like, sort of left liberal feminism things kind of sl slipping in there in a symbolic way in the very first scene. Yeah, definitely. I mean, she's definitely, like, a, uh, a sex symbol and in some ways even a uh, kind of feminist icon. I mean, like, the, the woman who is... Uh, um, who, who feels bored and tired and uh, confined by the different mores of society. And her character is one that basically smashes every single one of them. She's rebellious. She's wild. She has uh, dreams of fame and celebrity. It, it really is kind of flies in the face of what would have been um, prior a lot of the uh, mores. She sexually dominates uh, Clyde as well. Like Clyde, you get the imp like. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if that's actually part of the law. Or is it, is that just the movie, where Clyde? It's 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 kind of implied that Clyde is either a virgin and he he's never been with a woman before, or he's just impotent. But either way, there is this running theme of her trying to entice him into sex, quite blatantly as well. And uh, he's always looking for excuses to to get out of it. Uh, but was it, so in in that she's definitely in the, in the driving seat. <laughs> if you'll excuse the pun there, she's <laughs> she she's she's definitely in the dominant position sexually between the two of them, which is another kind of um, liberation feminist kind of thing. But I'm not sure if that's actually part of the the real story or not. I'm pretty sure it is not actually, um, but uh, it is true that uh, the 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 historical figure of Bonnie Parker was somewhat of a a hopeless romantic, if you can if you want to use that phrase. I guess it would probably in reality she was more of like a narcissist and a sociopath, but we can get to that later. But the character in the film definitely has just these romantic dreams of uh, of celebrity. She's infatuated, like she's really infatuated by Clyde's boldness, like in the first scene where uh, they meet. He's steal. Uh, he's stealing her mother's car. He's trying to steal her mother's car, and uh, then that's how that's the, how she first uh, meets him. That's not how it actually happened in in history. But basically, she's infatuated by his um, boldness and his exhilarating lifestyle and his uh, really just willingness to break the rules. He dares him to rob a store, and then he just walks into the store, steals a, a wad of cash, and then runs off, and they steal a car. Uh, she's she's definitely a character that's really. Um, that that really loves the limelight. So a, th a thrill seeker. She writes poetry, which is also correct. Uh, that that you know, the real Bonnie Parker actually did that. And um, I kind of think that the character is more meant to be the Bonnie Parker from the photos that they took in um, the, the the photos that were discovered in the hideout. Which uh, I think that pretty much every uh, adaptation of the story has said that they actually sent the photos to the media, which wasn't true, but. You would see, you would understand that, you know, from from the perspective of someone who is like a thrill seeker, a rebel, they would want everyone to know, like, just how bad they are, just how um, how how willing they are to fly in the face of kind of this society that they view as unjust, oppressing, and uh, depre and uh, depressing, really. Mm. I think it's it's uh, interesting when you look at Clyde as well and his his kind of story, which which I, I found that to be better fleshed out in the the Kevin Costner we the like the newer movie to be honest, but um, the, the the general backdrop is they they do live in poverty they they do come from nothing it's set during the Great Depression, and so it it isn't it isn't a sort of um, rise and fall Scarface type thing they. They're always poor, they're, and even even on a successful robbery, they never seem to get much money. So the, the, almost the whole movie is just them being chased around the countryside. So, so it's it, it's not it's it's these these kinds of um, these kinds of crime dramas, these American things. They're very different from the the more the mafia ones to the north. It's a it's a completely different kind of thing. But it's interesting that they're both celebrated by Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, with, with the character of Clyde, I kind of thought that he was a mix between a ro between Robin Hood and a Wild West cowboy living in Depression era Texas. So one thing is that his character is shameless about his criminality, but he's also conscious of the plight of the poor. So um, there's many scenes that basically show him as kind of a Robin Hood figure. Uh, the only people that they actually kill in the film are uh, police officers, and then the only civilian is a banker. And they talk about like the banks as kind of the big bad guy in the movie. So, uh, for example, there's the scene where um, 
he uh, where they're to doing target practice at some farm that was confiscated by the bank and then the far the former owner comes up and he says that used to be my house but uh the bank took it away from me and then clyde says well we rob banks and he hands him the gun and the guy fires a few shots at the at his former house um so yeah the character of clyde he is kind of like a robin hood so he is um he sees himself as kind of like this hero of the poor so he only targets the banks he only steals from the rich there's the other scene where uh, there's a guy at the where there's a bank that they're robbing and there's a guy who's withdrawing some money and Clyde says to him is that your money or the bank's money and he says it's my money and then Clyde says he can keep it uh, when then that later on they say that the guy they do an interview with the guy and he says well they're good by me and I'll bring flowers to their to their funeral so they kind of try to make him out to be this working class hero Robin Hood figure but he does he does go into like a hardware shop or a shop and try to stick that up. That's the first time they get into trouble because there's this big fat guy tries to kill him with a meat cleaver. I mean he he acts shocked as well. Yeah, he even says when they're running away, I'm not against them. I mean, though you were stealing his store and nearly beat him half to death. Yeah, so um, it's, it's, it's so yeah, so it's it's kind of playing around with its own mythology a little bit. But there, there's there's no doubt about it that it's like a really sympathetic kind of portrayal of, of, of two, two, like you say, Robin Hood. Um, and they're glamorous and they're, they're lovely and they're charismatic and they're funny. And I mean, you, you've also got a young Gene Hackman comes in as well. You say young, Gene Hackman plays his brother and his wife's like a real pain in the ass. And uh, as the Americans would say, but I mean, just, just as a side note, Gene Hackman always looks the same. Gene Hackman looks the same in that is what he did in the Unforgiven in like 1990. He never seems to get any old light. So it's just, it's just, it's just, he's just had that like potato face for all his life, and he doesn't, he doesn't like mature or anything. He's always the same. But I, I, I do, I do love Gene Hackman though. I think he's a, he's a sort of a man's man. So it was nice to see him pop up as well. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's even one thing that they, because the one common crime that they committed was stealing cars. And uh, that's what they probably did most likely. That was the crime they pro or they did the most often. Uh, and he does that throughout the movie. Whenever they they go they go to a new town, Clyde steals a new car. They even have a scene though where uh, he steals a guy's car, and then th that guy and his girlfriend drive after them, trying to get the car back in her car. And um, it's it's Gene Wilder, <laughs> uh, and he's yelling in his car, "I'm going to tear them apart! How dare they steal my car!" But then um, the uh, they say, oh, we'll call the police and turn around. But then the Barrow gang then starts pursuing them. And <laughs> they kidnap the two. Uh, they, they kidnap, uh, what's his name? Um, Gene Wilder's character and his girlfriend. But then these guys actually end up liking the gang. So even someone who, who just had their car stolen by uh, the Barrow gang, they even try to make them sympathetic to those people. So even uh, the, the victims of their theft end up actually liking them because they're just so wild and just so rambunctious and just so uh, exciting to be around. Yeah, that's right. And, and he, he, I mean, given Gene Wilder's background, it's it's kind of interesting. It's a similar background to the director. But um, the, the, it's like he he and that his girlfriend are much more middle class and bourgeois. And it's it's kind of like, yeah, they're, they're going to understand this as well. They're going to go along with these working class rebels who are like stealing from the banksters and this kind of thing. Like it's, it, we're all in it together against the, the capitalist pigs is the message I think there. The, 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 instead of them being part of the system, it's all one big hoot against against the the, the bankers. But it it's it kind of it kind of begins to the wheels come off a little bit with some of the shootouts, I think. Yeah, the, the, there's even something that you notice in the film is that they put in a lot of the cliches of Westerns at the time. So like they say that Clyde is the best shot in all of Texas and that he there's a scene where he goes into the bank and he shoots the hat off of the cop or when Frank Hamer is trying to ambush them. We'll get into the scene later, but uh, Clyde shoots the gun out of his hand. And um, <laughs> I mean, uh, they have all these uh, they have all these like um, 1960s cliches, the things that you see in a lot of the Clint Eastwood uh, spaghetti Western movies. Uh, Clyde is kind of made out to also be this cowboy when in reality, he actually killed a lot of people just by uh, uh, by shooting them without them noticing. So he was never really much actually a gunslinger, to, so to say, in reality. But 
um, they they kind of put that uh, archetype, which was so famous uh, in the '60s, into the movie. I, what I wanted to to talk about was the banks. So what I'd say is with the with Bonnie and Clyde, it's an it's an old left movie made for the new left. So the old what is the old left and the new left? So the old left is the Marxian left of the early 20th century. So the ones that are focused on class struggle, the rich, the poor, proletariat, the working class, the bourgeoisie. Whereas the new left is the one from the 60s onward. And it's the one that I think we're more familiar with today. So this is the ones that are obsessed with things like race and gender and sexuality, you know, and people like Marcuse and so, and so forth. Um, the movie takes place in the 30s. So it's before the advent of the new left. But this was when the new left was really on the rise. And I think it was made for that audience. Uh, the villain of the, in the movie is the bank, so to say, or it is the rich. Whereas and Bonnie and Clyde are kind of these two folk heroes for the poor fighting back against the rich during the Great Depression. Yeah. Yeah. And there, yes. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. So, yeah, it even, uh, like you mentioned, they were living in squalor uh, for most of the film. They never kind of become wealthy. They, um, it kind of puts them as, as part of the proletariat. So they are like of the poor because they also are just living out of their cars or camping out or living in these abandoned houses or something. And uh, the police, we'll get into the police as well, but they're kind of seen as the servants of the bourgeoisie. They're the ones who are uh, defending the interests of the rich. There's even the scene where they, where they capture Hamer that he, that Clyde says to him, you're a Texas Ranger. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be protecting poor people, not coming after folks like us. Yes, it is. So the, the, it, it, do, it does, I thought of this as well. It does have quite a Marxist angle because it, one of the things that I was thinking about, which I think is interesting is that, it's when they shoot the police um, and it's as if there's two ways you can look at that and to the general public and definitely to the, or to the system, when they, when they kill the cops, um, especially in the Kevin Costner one, but we'll come to that. When they kill the cops, it's as if this is much worse than killing a normal person. And it, the, the cops, as you say, are part of the system. They are the ones defending the banks, and the banks are robbing from the people. And so it's as, almost as if to say it's just a, if you want to take out the banks and if you want to take out this capitalist uh, system, then you're also they, the, then it's it's fair game to shoot the cops because they are its enforcers. They are there to protect the banks. And but what they also do, which I think is interesting, is when um, it, it moves on in such a way that when the rangers begin to come into it, they are kind of like rural hillbilly types themselves. And so all of a sudden you see something beginning to emerge, which I think in the, the new left would be would, would bring us to where we are today. And it's where working class whites also get lumped in with the cops and the system and the banks. Which is so you can almost see in embryonic form the like white privilege theory and stuff in the very very early stages. If it starts with the cops and it's okay to shoot the cops because they are protecting the banks, then it all runs on the back of the the, the sort of the in this case it's these rural whites and you can see in the culture war today as they call it the the the, the absolute especially in America the absolute demonization of those whites. And, and there's this kind of fairy tale aspect to it as well, where it, you, you know it's going to end badly, but they know it's going to end badly as well because the, like, the house will always win. Eventually, time's up and the system will crush you. Your, your kind of sad little rebellion will be put down brutally. Yeah, because in, in the scenes where they are ambushed at the beginning. So when they're in the house and they're ambushed after the, I think the grocery boy turns them in, all the cops have the traditional uh, blue police officer uniform that was uh, really common in the era. But I'm pretty sure in the scene, I may be mistaken here, but in the scene where they're ambushed in the ravine, the, the part where the scene where uh, Buck dies, so Clyde's brother's killed, uh, I believe that all the, the cops that were hunting them were just regular like uh, posse guys or something like that. They were, uh, they definitely weren't the same cops that were um, uh, pursuing them earlier, if, if I'm not mistaken, though. Was that what you were referring to? 
Yeah, and then at the end as well, like what you see as it goes on is this slow transition from where it's just the cops, and by the end they're all just wearing clothes. So the, it lo it looks like it's just this kind of posse of white men hunting them down. Yeah, and uh, what I'd say is that um, the film, if I had to put an ideology on it, I'd say it's anarchism. So. Uh, the the uh, ult ultimate message really is that it kind of glorifies criminality and disrespects the law as kind of a righteous rebellion against the unjust capitalist system. So the the police are kind of just seen as these grunts. Uh, so for example, uh, we'll get into him later, but Frank Hamer, who's the the main character of the second film, he's uh, portrayed as being this old buffoon, and he's made a fool of by the by the young rebels. And uh, you know th they try to really. Um, portray like the the um the criminality as justified if it's against this certain system so uh kind of so the the kill, so killing the cops so they're you're killing the oppressor really uh who's upholding the uh who's upholding the oppression of the of the poor folk oh I'll yeah look. yeah yeah what what so what what um what all of this it, it kind of directs to i think is this like anarchism but it's definitely yeah, but it's definitely um, anti-authoritarianism there. And I think there's something which is actually very like liberal in that. And I don't mean in a liberal pro progressive way, which is kind of what we've been talking about here, but in like liberalism in its, in its big way and in, in what, what America has founded on, because in the end, that's what they are doing. They, it is a complete rejection of any kind of authority. Um, it, well, obviously, with this in this case, it's the state and the police, and it's this kind of thing where I we just want to be able to do what we want, like, like anarchy. And and uh, this, I think, is rooted in deep, deep in in liberalism. It's they they want liberty. They don't want to have. The, the kind of what's what you're expected what's expected of you in society uh, the free just the freedom just to do whatever the hell they want and when you when I think about it it, it kind of you are saying it's like it is like a western because it, it's kind of like say uh, 70 years or so after the end of the western and they've got cars but besides from that it is just the western and you, so it's like a quintessential American form of, of people like being able to just wander free under the stars. And both of these movies make a, a big thing about showing these huge open expanses, just these vast, enormous vistas of empty countryside that they're going to like wander around in and, and just, just being free. And I think I was thinking that this is something and so when you get to the the media and things it's it's interesting how celebrated this is by americans you know yeah the, the american frontier it's always been uh, i mean certainly definitely part of their it's definitely part of their country their culture um but what what i wanted to say though was that um in terms of the, what you were mentioning earlier about uh, kind of the liberation the liberalism as in getting rid of any kind of authority one thing that's interesting is that there is some scenes that they suggest uh, quitting crime and they talk about like what their life would be like if they lived a normal life, you know, had a family, had a normal house, had a normal job. But that's kind of uh, portrayed as being boring in comparison to the glamorized lifestyle of always being on the run, always, you know, having these fight these fights with the cops, always, uh, you know, be being in the media, being seen as these folk heroes, that's really like seen as a lot more glamorous than the, um, than the, than the normal traditional lifestyle of, you know, getting married, having kids, having a, having your own house somewhere and maybe even having land. Uh, so I don't know if, would you say that's really liberal? I'd say that's more really, uh, progressive liberal, definitely more progressive and maybe even more anarchistic than, uh, than, than even like the classical liberal liberalism of America, because, I mean, the, the uh, ideals that America is founded on, definitely, it doesn't, I don't think it was meant to reject, uh, like, the family. It wasn't meant to reject the uh, settled lifestyle. Maybe you could say that as a result of that, that thing has died off. But um, I, I'd say it definitely, Bonnie and Clyde, it goes in a, a lot more of a progressivist, anarchistic direction of kind of rejecting 
the traditional lifestyle entirely in favor of this uh, illustrious, hypersexualized, romantic life on the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd agree. Yeah, I, but I do. I think I do think it's 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 all of this is is very American. And when because we're so saturated in, in American culture, you you we tend. I, I think people tend to view it as well. This is kind of the norm. But it actually isn't. I mean, I cannot imagine this story playing out when you when you look at it as a whole. I cannot imagine it playing out anywhere else. I mean, is there this kind of uh, spirit to Canada? Because people will say this is something which is um, like Anglo. It's it's like this Anglo liberal distance yourself from authority kind of thing. But to be fair, like this, the, the Bonnie and Clyde story wouldn't play out. We've got figures like uh, James, Bo um, James Bond, Robin Hood. But by and large, I think England, I think in, in England, people are too rooted to a place and to how they were, to a set of traditions. But when you go to a new country like America, this, I think this spirit can just run wild. And, and they've got a long, long history of, of it doing exactly that to the point which I, another thing i, I think is interesting is that like they, they they are celeb like the media loves them so you can say um as folklore heroes for example you may get somebody from ireland or spain or somewhere a political a political figure who, a bit of a revolutionary and they end up getting killed and they will become a folklore hero. They'll be seen as a martyr. But that's also because of the political cause they were fighting for. In Bonnie and Clyde, like it's it's just freedom. It's 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 just, it's just all they did was like rob banks and shoot cops. And the idea, and it did happen. Like in reality, in the real world, when they they died, there were tens of thousands of people who came up to mourn them. And and I just I I think this is totally baffling uh, and and only in america as they say i can't imagine it happening anywhere else can you uh no actually like actually i can't i think even in canada where you do have the vast open lands we don't have the same culture of uh the same culture of firearms like for example one of the reasons that the laws in canada were different than the laws in america now you know firearm ownership is higher in canada than most of europe but uh one of the reasons was because of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So they created this police force of mounted police officers to police this huge domain, which uh, Canada inherited when the settlers moved out west. Whereas in America, they didn't have anything like that. So it was a lot more like anarchistic. It was a lot more wild, so to say. People needed to defend themselves on their own properties. So definitely things like the gun culture, the land. Uh, and then I also think something you have to put into that is the culture of rebellion. So. America is a country founded on rebellion, whereas Canada is one that's really founded on loyalty to the British Empire, whereas America was founded on rebellion against it. And then also, I think mass media. I think that that's also something that's crucial to it, that America is one thing, one thing that's maybe a lot more recent about America within the last century, but it is mass media and its ability to create, uh, create different folk heroes, to create different narratives. And I'll, we'll probably get into this a bit more in a the set if when we talk about the highwaymen but its ability to create to turn uh villains into heroes and heroes into villains because mm, it sells i mean yeah it's, it's interesting what you say there that even like from its very inception it was a, re a rejection of authority it was like a move towards more liberty and freedom and eventually that is tearing around in the countryside being chased by, by like and and the authority figures being uh, sort of demonized by by the press in it almost they come very close to that yeah, the, I, the, yep. the, the press the press itself is interesting because I, i'm i'm gonna I, it, it, it because they could have gone the other way and demonized them i mean in what's interesting is that in the, the bonnie and clyde 67 version clyde complains quite a lot at how they're being portrayed by the press because the, 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 the press is bigging them up and saying that they did all kinds of things which they didn't actually do. So it, the, the press is like bending over backwards to big them up. I mean, just the purely cynical thing here would be where they're doing that to sell more newspapers. But equally, they could have demonized them um, as being the, like, all, like something demonic. Uh, that that had to be killed as quickly as possible and still sold papers or maybe 
the 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 mythology and the glorification was better for business or something like that. But I I, I think it's that something in the American psyche that just likes that idea of of the rebel, um, of the rebel like pushing back against the man, against the system. Yeah. Uh, so it uh, it's actually interesting that historically there was this uh, one. Uh, a, sp a specifically gruesome uh, pair of murders that they committed. There was these two police officers who would, were gunned down by uh, Bonnie and Clyde. And there it was published in the paper that uh, Bonnie Parker walked over to one of him, one of them while he was lying on the ground and uh, turned him over and then shot him in the face and then said that his head bounced like a rubber ball when it hit the ground. When in reality, it was probably actually Clyde and one of the male accomplices that actually killed the two of them. Because the story was uh, discredited, like he said that there was a that there was a cigar found on the ground when she didn't smoke cigars. But um, after that, they, the media in the actual story actually did flip. So uh, they kind of did become these villains in the media after a while. Like they published this uh, cartoon in a paper in Texas that said uh, that showed um, an electric chair and it says "reserved for Bonnie and Clyde." So eventually, the, they actually did flip on that but it you know it was more media sensation sensationalism isn't they go from kind of being the the folk heroes to the the public enemy number one but the movie never has any of that so the movie never actually has this part uh this like turning point where they go where the public kind of figures out yeah they're they might not actually be these uh these you know great folk heroes after all they're probably just killers and <laughs> that's completely left out of the movie entirely yeah because that's a difficult difficult sell they they want them to be these Romantic, rebellious, he anti-heroes, and if you're even if like let alone, I mean, even if just Clyde had have done that scene where they just execute two cops, that wouldn't have fit well with the narrative that they're trying to build with the the movie. It would have been really difficult. So even if they got book Gene Hackman's character, even if it was him and the main two weren't involved, it would have still. Uh, it would have still been a very difficult to pull that off in a, in a in a movie, but the idea that like Faye Dunaway's character would have gone like the you know shot two cops with a shotgun and then she kind of kicks one over and shoves it in his face and blows his head off so he can see it he can see it coming like that would be that's just completely out of kilter with the kind of sexy alluring character they're they're trying to portray with with uh, Faye Dunaway's uh, Bonnie. Yeah, I, I think that before we, we transition to the to the Highwaymen, we should go over a bit of the criticism of this film. So uh, it was criticized by a lot of people for both like glorifying violence and being you know extremely edgy for the time. Like the scene at the end where uh, during the ambush, which is in both movies, that was seen as like like horrifically violent for the 1960s standards. It, they were not used to having very much blood in movies at the time. And, you know, that last scene, it's in both films, it's completely insane. They just get shot like hundreds of times. It's crazy. But um, one of the things uh, th that was interesting is that there is a there was a member of the gang named uh, in, in real life. He was named D.W. Jones. And the, the young boy who's like following them, he's kind of an amalgamation of different members of the bank of the Barrow gang. So different people who are accomplices to them. And uh, he was actually alive during the film's release. He was a teenager when he was in the gang and he criticized the film a lot for romanticizing the lifestyle when he said, in reality, it really was just hell. And uh, so, you know, definitely um, uh, the, the uh, what's his name? Buck Barrow's wife, the, so the screaming crazy wife that always uh, like yelled whenever there was violence. She was actually alive too. And she, she wasn't happy about her portrayal either. But I think probably the, you want to add something to that? I was just going to say she's yeah. actually she's actually really. Uh, I saw a picture of her when I was I was watching some documentaries on it this morning, and I, there was a couple of pictures of her popped up of what she looked like when she was in the gang, and she was actually very good looking. Um, but in the in the movie, she's kind of really drab, and you can tell they just didn't want to put another woman. Uh, in competition with Faye Dunaway, like it was all about Faye Dunaway being like drop dead gorgeous, sexy, without any competition from any other women. So it, it's just an interesting little touch that they did that I didn't expect. She's kind of like this drab middle aged housewife <laughs> and she, in the movie, and she she wasn't in real life. She wasn't like that at all in real life. She's probably better looking than Bonnie. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I, yeah, as you said, though, it would kind of take away from the uh, the legendary status of Bonnie Parker as this, you know, beautiful machine gun wielding maiden. Um, 
but I think that the biggest criticism that probably uh, was warranted against this film was from uh, Frank Hamer's widow. So we should say we should talk about this scene where uh, and this this didn't actually happen in real life, but there's a scene where Frank Hamer is trying to sneak up on the gang. Uh, he's trying to sneak up on the gang um, while they're uh, just sitting at a creek, and then um, Clyde shoots the gun out of his hand and says, "Reach for the sky, sheriff." And that basically what they do is they, they tie his hands up, they put him on the car, they take mocking photos of him, and then uh, put, put him into a, a rowboat and then kick him off into the middle of the lake. Uh, and it basically like humiliates him. It's made, I guess it's really kind of a, a big F you to just to authority in general, but also to the um, authority of, of America at the time. Because I guess if you think of a mid 20th century American guy, you'd think of, you know, a... Uh, you could probably think of it, this hard nosed cop from Texas. Uh, and, you know, this was kind of at the time of the new left, this would have been the, you know, the straight white man patriarch who was oppressing everyone. So it was just a big F you to him. And they kicked him off into the, into the lake and uh, his, um, cause we're going to talk about him a lot later. He, he's actually the, the main character in the second film that we're going to talk about. He was a, he's a decorated Texas Ranger and has a, fantastic history a fascinating history mm. um but his his widow actually sued the film studio for this portrayal of him and and actually settled out of court so she probably won a lot of money because uh, she was just so angry that uh the portrayal of you know a man who rightfully could be called an american hero was just uh, i mean it was just so horrible i mean he was portrayed as this, this complete moron mm. and um i think what why the because they, they could have just shot him as well. But they, they, again, it's that problem of taking the shine off the heroes. So they, they, they wanted to just humiliate him and leave him alive because they, they, they've got good hearts deep down. Um, and that's kind of the message. Because there, there is there is this another, another like leftist kind of argument would be that they are just products of their background. Like if if you exploit people and you run them down and people are living in poverty and the, the and you, then you are going to get this because you're creating the conditions, you're creating the material conditions where people will do this. So it's it's like yet another trope. But despite all of that, they they've still got good hearts. It's just that it's the system which has uh, created this this whole shit show, really. Um, one thing that I did want to pop, like, just slip in was uh, I, I was looking at some of the uh, the reviews of this, and I went back to our old friend Pauline Kale, uh, who, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the yeah, dirty yeah. hairy one, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you don't need to look on Wikipedia; she is. And so in the 60s, she was like a really big um, movie reviewer. And she absolutely despised Dirty Harry. Like she said it was fascist. She said that the violence made her physically sick. It was this disgusting, like just outright Nazi propaganda. Might makes right. The the white guy cop blowing away all the, the underprivileged minorities and everything like this. And um, it turns out she's actually fine with violence. She 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 because she loved Bonnie and Clyde. So she, and she was saying it was like this poetic kind of romantic American myth, and the violence is there, but it, it's it's a contextualized. So that's fine now. So all of a sudden, they kind of when when it's when it's like coming from Bonnie and Clyde's direction, she's totally fine with it and sung its praises. But I mean, in a way, I will agree. It is, it is a poetic American myth. Uh, and so, and, and I'll also say that just, just to read her, obviously she's like you know, the, the enemy. She's a very progressive uh, metropolitan, cosmopolitan <laughs> liberal, but, but like just to read her reviews is, is quite uh, good. She, she cites, you know, classic literature and all of this kind of thing. And it's just a little sign of how how we've lost all of that kind of thing, you know. But yeah, so to so like the, the, the liberal reviewer who hated Dirty Harry a few years later, um, she she's per she was perfectly fine with Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. Uh, my father actually mentioned once that he saw this movie when he was a young boy. It came out when he would have been like 10. And he actually even said to his his father, Dad, aren't they kind of making the bad guys the heroes? <laughs> weren't the cops supposed to be the heroes 
Uh, so yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, I think we might have mentioned this earlier, but if you're wondering who directed the first Bonnie and Clyde, the ethnic background, all I'm going to say is just yes. Um, but anyway, I think we should move into the Highwaymen because this th these two movies really cr uh, contrast um, very well. And we're basically going to look at one from the completely different uh, angle politically, the Highwaymen. So this movie is about Frank Hamer and his partner. Uh, Manny Galt and the, how they hunted and how they hunted down Bonnie and Clyde. And I think what I want to start with is that before we even get to like down to the uh, um, before we get to the character of Hamer and the, and the and Bonnie and Clyde and stuff, I think what's most interesting, even before just the history is, is the setting of um, the, the setting of the movie and the theme of modernity. So when we talked about once upon a time in the West, we mentioned that, it takes place at the very beginning of the end of the Wild West. So it's when the railroad is just coming in and that's when uh, modernity is going to arrive. So once that's there, that's when it's when all of modern society is coming. Well, the Highwaymen kind of takes place when the Wild West has finally ended. So modernity has arrived in Texas, gone to the days of the frontier and the cowboys. And now there are cities, cars, electricities and supermarkets uh, everywhere. And uh, modernity has arrived. So uh, and along with that is kind of a li more liberal uh, form of politics, a more modern form of, of politics in contrast to the chaotic barbarism of the o Old West. One thing that uh, people might not know is in the movie, the uh, governor of Texas is a woman. Uh, that's not political correctness. It might surprise you to know that in 1934, the governor of Texas actually was a woman, believe it or not. And, you know, what's interesting about that is that could even just be seen as part of, you know, modernity coming in, kind of the softening of society. It, they didn't put this in the film, but uh, in real life, Frank Hamer quit when he said they're fine. They're electing women as governor. I think I'm done. I'm done. Uh, I'm, I'm done in law enforcement. So, you know, he's someone who definitely is uh, of a different time. He's kind of of the 19th century. He's of the, the uh, old West, the old cowboy. And he was he kind of started his career just when that was ending and he saw, he saw just the beginning of the, of modernity, the, the normal, uh, when, when this was full, fully, um, the beginning, uh, when it was fully implemented. And that's when he kind of said, I've had enough, I'm out of here. But then he's brought back when there's a new form of criminals and Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. I was taken back by the Texas governor. Uh, uh, as soon as, uh, uh, Kathy Bates was the actress, wasn't it? As soon as I saw her come on, I just paused it and went to, to Wikipedia to see if this was true. And uh, yeah, I did, yeah. I, I did the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's she. There was a, a female governor of Texas in like nineteen thirty four, and um, she. I mean, it's interesting because the Texas Rangers have been disbanded, haven't they? And it's after Bonnie and Clyde they bring them back. Yeah. So at the. The second th scene of the film, the first scene is of Bonnie and Clyde breaking some of their great, their uh, associates out of prison. Now, it is interesting that you never actually see their faces until the very end scene, the very lot when they're ambushed and killed. It never actually shows their faces until then, but you do see their their uh, fellow gang members. Uh, but then the second scene is uh, of the of the, the female governor now saying answering the media and saying that. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde are not folk heroes. They're they're criminals. And what one of them said, it was one of the people in the crowd said, there, some people are saying they're Robin Hoods. And uh, she replied, I don't think Robin Hood ever killed a gas station clerk for four dollars and a tank of gas. And then the following scene is when uh, they're she's having a discussion with her cabinet, I believe, or the uh, whoever it is, the the officials in Texas, and they're they're suggesting bringing back the Texas Rangers. So. Um, in, in the film, they had been disbanded, and that two, uh, I think, two years earlier. But they decided they're they're going to that they're well. People are pu proposing to her to bring them back in order to uh, hunt down these new criminals. And what she says is, "No way! It's 1934. It's not the gunslinger days anymore. We can't possibly bring back Frank Hamer." I think someone said, "Like, oh, why don't we go dig up Wyatt Earp?" So you do see this great contrast between the old West, the uh, gunslinger West, you know, the one of the cowboy and the new modern Texas with uh, the modern police forces and all these different liberal rights and uh, these new institutions and the new technology. The contrast is very stark. It's yeah. The, the, everything about this is different. So the, even like just the tone of the, the film itself is re it's really slow moving and it's, it's really somber in, in, in how it feels. 
Um, it's it's, it's the, the shots and everything. It, 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 again, you get those lovely, beautiful shots of like huge open countryside. But he, it's it's he, you can see that this is a man who's he, he's got like a pot belly and he's been around forever and he's kind of like world weary. And it's like it's like kind of no country for old rangers, where the, the modern world, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, and you've got to come back and um, go after these people. And another thing which is, I think, really interesting, it, it makes, for me, it makes, um, it, sort of intellectually, I think the, the high women's more interesting because Kevin Costner's uh, him has got a very black and white worldview. So he, he in Bonnie and Clyde, we did get all of this leftist thinking about well, it, it's their, they're a product of their environment and all of this kind of thing. And this is, uh, the, the, these, kind, these kind of arguments get debunked and, and kind of uh, brushed aside throughout the highwaymen. And there's specific scenes which are set up to kind of attack these tropes. There's the, the, the one where you've got with his dad. Um, so, so Frank Hamer has a, has a discussion with Clyde's dad. And Clyde's dad says it started by Clyde stole a chicken when he was very young, and he ended up going to jail. And then when he went to jail, it it like kind of rotted him. And um, so he, what he's saying, and he uses the term a dark soul. He's saying he didn't have a dark soul. He he was he was hungry. He stole a chicken. He went to jail, and in jail he came out a different person. And Hamer turns around and say he tells his own story which is kind of an inversion where he wanted to be a priest, but he was kind of forced into being a lawman. But he, he kind of responds to this idea that Clyde's been, is, is a product of the system. And he just says, well, maybe he didn't always have a dark soul, but he does now. And that means that he has to be put down like a dog. Like it, there's, he doesn't have any sympathy for that kind of mumbo jumbo. What, what what matters in the here and now is it's not how we got here. It's not that the society created them, and um, we have to have sympathy for them, and we have to understand them in this progressive way. He's he's kind of saying, well, however he got like this, he is like this, and he needs to be put down. Yeah, I, I think that there's uh, three there's. Not only two, but I think there's actually three different worldviews competing in the Highwaymen. There's anarchism, the anarchism of Bonnie and Clyde, and also I'd say the media is also uh, is also involved in that. And then there's liberalism, which I think is embodied by the police force in the state of Texas. This being the governor, the FBI, the um, the officials, and then I'd say Hamer and Galt kind of embody reaction. They're like two reactionary figures who um, they're kind of fighting against both uh, the anarchism of Bonnie and Clyde, but also the liberalism of Texas, which, uh, I mean, you know, comparatively, uh, you know, today it wouldn't be like that, but but um, just comparatively like for the time compared to when they were, uh, when they were Rangers, but uh, it, it's them kind of fighting against both these two forces. So the anarchism, which is basically just hell on earth, this is chaos, this is evil in the world and the liberalism, which, prevents good from actually fighting the evil. So um, one thing that uh, you, there's lots of good scenes of that, of uh, Hamer and Galt butting heads with uh, the FBI or the other law enforcement agents. Like for example, uh, they, um, they, they're having, they're having this argument about where are they going to go next? Uh, like for example, they say, uh, that they won't come back here because we have all these officers everywhere. They're not going to come back to visit their parents. There's no way that'll happen because they'd be stupid if that happened. And Hamer says, well, one thing I know about uh, horses is that they always go back to where they're from or something like that. But basically his point is that it doesn't make sense. But yeah, they're going to come back because th that's where their families are. And they're going to eventually come back here. And we're going to be able to find where they're going based on this uh, based on this tendency. So it's interesting kind of the struggle between uh, not only between like the, the forces of evil, that being like the Bonnie and Clyde, but also between uh, liberalism and its kind of inability to actually fight evil and uh, reaction, which is the, the you know the sort of justice was, which is actually able to uh, which is actually able to strike evil down. 
Yeah, the, the the feds the feds are approaching it in a much more modern way, and they 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 it's, they've got like phone taps and and things like this, and Hema is of old school, and I love I love the archetype of what they were. You've got they're in the documentary about him. He's one hell of a character. He he killed fifty men. I mean he he is he is, and this is why it's disgusting the way on the Bonnie and Clyde movie they made a clown out of him. It, that's that's probably the most subversive element and the most insulting of everything that's in that movie. I mean, I think it's a great film, but the I, I can kind of enjoy Faye Dunaway like lying around naked behind her prison bars. You know, I, I can I can kind of put up with all of that. But when it's just a, like you've got this great man, this real hero of a man, and they just make a clown of him like that, I think that's actually repulsive. And I'm happy that they got sued for it. But um, so he, he Hema is in the Kevin Costner movie and then in real life, he is the man who will sit for three days in a, like under a tree in the rain because he knows that you're going to come past sooner or later. And he, he'll find the tiniest little uh, snippet of evidence and then he'll go after, he'll move, use that and move on. And he worked alone as well. So he's he's just like this relentless lone wolf who's quietly, inevitably going to blow your head off. Like you can run and you can outwit the feds with all of their fancy gadgets, but this old school approach of Hamer, he won't stop. He'll sleep, sleep in his car for two weeks and just he's just constantly tracking them down and you can feel like the net closing. And what he says is um, what you were saying about the horses is that he's saying as diff almost like there's different kinds of prey. And some of them, they, they, and this is true as well, he figured out that the Bonnie and Clyde moved in a big circle over time. Uh, and they always ended up going back to home base like a Mustang would. And he, he finds a, a – so another thing in this one is that but like Bonnie and Clyde almost aren't in it at all, and you can tell that's deliberate because they fade on away and Warren Beatty got all of the limelight and the glamour on the first one. They've been pretty much airbrushed out of this one entirely. But then on top of that, they really amplify the fact that Bonnie uh, – they, they, what happened is they had a car crash and Bonnie's leg got burned. And so it isn't Faye Dunaway being like the sexiest woman on earth anymore. Bonnie's like this hobbling little goblin with a gun that she can hardly lift and this psychotic little trollop and, and you, whose face you don't even see up until the end. But she's limping around like a, like a little cr crippled goblin creature. And so they've com it's completely demystifying uh, what, what, they, what she actually is. But he, but here Hema is the, this archetype who is um, so you've got these nut jobs now they've just become these nut jobs and Hema is this just relentless lone wolf who and I, I love that especially because he's old you know he's been around forever he's killed Mexican bandits and all of this kind of thing it's it's a great a great character. Yeah, definitely, and I, I love the scene where they're at the crimes they're they're at the scene of the crime. Where there's the two officers that have been murdered, and the the feds and the uh, the police department, they're like drawing circles around the ammunition. They're in, they're looking at it with like a magnifying glass, and then Hamer and Galt are just all just waltzing through. And then uh, like <laughs> there's a great scene when Galt, uh, Woody Harrelson's character, picks up two of the the shells, and then uh, the the uh, in, the inspector says, "Hey, what are you doing?" It's like, "Oh, you still got one left." <laughs> It's, it's, it's really good. But basically what this scene shows is that like they have no time for these new modern kind of uh, policing techniques because uh, basically uh, they rely on tradition. They re rely on their traditional knowledge that they've attained over decades of, of um, law enforcement of, you know, tracking different criminals, uh, you know, Mexicans uh, at the border and different gangs and stuff like that. Uh, they were big during prohibition as well. Uh, and they kind of just uh, acquired all this like knowledge and wisdom really for the criminal psyche and the criminal behavior while the, the FBI guys are just, they're looking at it in a very like scientific, very mathematical way. Uh, yeah. And it's just not as effective because like they uh, are always, uh, they're always uh, behind the, they're, they're, they're always outpaced by Bonnie and Clyde because their kind of method of going about this doesn't, it never actually works 
to catch them because they, they just they don't actually have that wisdom to rely on. Uh, like another one, another example is that th at the time, one strategy that Bonnie and Clyde used to evade the, the police was that they would cross state lines. So they, they were from Texas, but they also committed crimes in Louisiana, Kansas, Missouri, just different states in the Southern United States, because if the law officers were pursuing them, uh, they couldn't cross the state lines legally. It was out of their jurisdiction. So they knew that this was the best way to throw people, uh, throw officers off the trail. Uh, but whereas Hamer's character, he just like doesn't even give a shit about that. <laughs> There's the scene where they're driving in the car and they said, oh, we can't go. Uh, Woody Harrelson says, oh, we can't go past the Red River. You know, this is the Red River here. We're in Oklahoma now. <laughs> and he just doesn't even give a shit. Yeah, I, I, I love the bit where you've got like the feds are standing around, like scratching their heads and Hamer's going along the, the, the fence and they, they're laughing and shaking their head. But then he picks up a bottle of laudanum. So we know that Bonnie has been wounded. Uh, she's got a, that's why she's gimping around. So then it's like, well, here I discover as well, she's, she's drinking laudanum for the pain. And this then means where are they getting the laudanum from? How many shops sell this within the radius? And so then they almost catch them because of just that. And another thing that he kind of uh, realizes is that. The, like it, the way they are killing the cops, um, how easy it is. It, it doesn't. It, it it doesn't seem to make sense. From a you know, just like a just looking at it scientifically, why aren't the cops just blowing them away? And Hema realizes, like just through wisdom and understanding human psychology, that the cops, who obviously they're all men, but they are very. And this is like a running theme as well in in the in the movie they are very uncomfortable with the idea of shooting a girl. Like, because Bonnie's, you know, she, I think she's like 20 or 21 years old, and she really is like about five foot one or something. And she's limping around. And so the uh, the problem that the cops have got is that even though, you know, the men, of men, manly men, they've seen a lot of action, none of them have had to shoot a girl before. And this is why when they're thinking about it and trying to sort of, get through to Bonnie, Clyde will come out and shoot them. And th this is, seems to have happened again and again. And it's Hema who understands that they're going to have to kill the girl. Like, you, you, you're, not, you're just going to have to shoot the girl, or we're going we're to keep losing cops. Yeah, I, I, there's even, even there's a scene when uh, Galt actually feels a bit, feels uh, really nervous about actually having to kill a girl. He's saying, oh, is there any way that we can actually do this without actually shooting a woman? I've never shot a woman before. That seems to be against what I'm about. Uh, but yeah, and Hamer's just saying, we, we have to do this or else uh, we're going to be losing more cops. Uh, another great scene that it's probably my favorite scene of the movie is when they're at the gas station. Uh, so they're filling up their tank in a gas station in Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah it's And uh, so they say to the gas station attendant, have you seen uh, the, any people coming by here? A, a young woman and two uh, men. She had a young bunny rabbit. Uh, and the guy says, no, I haven't seen them. And if it was Bonnie and Clyde, more luck to them. They only rob banks, not the poor folks like us. And what's so interesting about that scene is you might miss this if you didn't pay attention earlier. The the second scene of the movie, um, the... Uh, the, the female governor, the governor, she says um, that uh, Bonnie and Clyde had murdered a gas st the station attendant. So what the guy was saying was a lie. It was something that he read in the media because he read in the papers that there are these folk heroes robbing the banks and uh, fighting for the poor, fighting back against this capitalist system that's, you know, making you poor and stuff like that. When that's actually factually incorrect, most people who Bo Bonnie and Clyde usually attacked regular people. The, the most common targets were uh, gas stations or grocery, grocery stores or something like that. So this is somebody who is probably the most likely person for them to rob. And due to the media and due to the, the lies that are being told in the media and the, and the legacy that's being built up around them, he thinks that they're heroes when in the reality is completely the opposite. So it's great what happens next is that uh, Kevin Costner, so Hamer, what he does is he punches the guy in the face, shoves his head against the, the bumper of the car and puts a gun at, and then puts a gun at his head saying, you better tell me where they are that, uh, cause they just murdered an officer and his family is going to be on the bread line next uh, yeah. week. So more power to them. Uh, but you know, it's just such a great contrast between, you know, the legacy and the, the media Bonnie and Clyde versus the reality when, you know, you see the reality it actually is like horrific. 
it's and not it's, what they were the media saying. And it, it's it's also a sort of bursting of, of of that idea that we got into earlier, where the cops are just part of the power from a sort of Marxian perspective. The cops are just there protecting the banks and the power system. Therefore, it's free game to shoot the cops. So it, it, what Kevin Costner has, uh, does is say, um, like, you know, when, when this the, the, the broke at the gasoline station, he's bigging them up and he's saying they're heroes. And Costner says, because uh, they're just shooting cops. And he says, like, they, it's what you're talking about is, is a girl that blew a man's head off so he could see it coming um, and out like where he couldn't defend himself. But then that man has now left a family and they're going to be on the bread line within two weeks. Like this is, so it, it isn't, it, there is a human element here, which, which is being lost on the, the just the purely kind of power dynamic take on it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely meant to like uh, tear apart that idea that um, kind of kind of the Marxian dialectic of, oh, you know, the, the working class heroes versus the oppressive cops on the side of the banks when that really just isn't the case, really just isn't the case at all. Um, and, you know, it's also just a, a really interesting theme in the movie is the media. Like you'll see that uh, Hamer and Galt are just completely disgusted by the, the media. Like w one of the Frank Hamer's main motivations for coming back and actually uh hunting them down is just the media coverage that they're getting uh like they're at the beginning he's reading in the newspaper about this gunfight where there, there's thousands of rounds fired uh casualties and uh that's what that's why he's coming back he's coming back because the media is building up these criminals as uh heroes whereas uh, there's a bit of a difference with galt with galt he he kind of just spends the entire movie like uh just shocked at how horrible and the modern world really is becoming like he's just horrified by the violence He's disgusted by the media, and he kind of just wants it all to be over. Whereas Hamer, he kind of just sees this as this uh, this um, quest that he ha that he has no choice but to accomplish. Yeah, he 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 sees it as a, a, a good versus evil dynamic, and he even says after the the the, the, the gruesome uh, when Bonnie shoots the, the cop in the head, and there's somebody kind of be I think it, somebody mentions that Bonnie's like quite hot or something like that. But at any rate, he he say he turns around and he says they just aren't human anymore. Those though that that cute girl isn't human anymore, and then he he talks about them having dark souls. He he and it's it's kind of unnerving just how dedicated he is to killing them, to killing evil. And I I, I cannot help but applaud it. I think it's I think it's I think it's a great mentality to have. There's none of this kind of let relativistic let's get lost in the weeds about what is good and what is wrong and all the uh, product of their environment and their upbringing again it's like well even if that was the case they're dark now they are evil now and what they are now is something which needs to be destroyed um apparently it did he apparently the it the manner of bonnie's death in like in the real world in the real history that did actually shock him to his core though um because apparently when she she did let out this horrible kind of scream uh, as the as the lead when who <laughs> went in from all directions yeah the character that he says that to was um i forget what his name was a uh, ted hinton or something like that i think that was his name they called him ted but what what uh what was interesting about him is that he actually knew bonnie and clyde personally I think that he had attended the uh, restaurant. He had often dined at the restaurant where Bonnie worked, and uh, in the and they they bring him along because he can positively identify the two of them. So they need him, they need this officer with them because he's gonna I identify them and he's gonna tell them about like their background. And when he's describing uh, them to Hamer, he talks about how Bonnie is this cute little thing, you know, can't weigh 90 pounds. She has caramel colored hair and that she was the smartest girl in school. She loved poetry and all this stuff. And he's like, uh, and you know, I think what Galt says, uh, says that, oh, he's sweet on her. Whereas Hamer says, uh, oh, she has a beautiful soul. You think that she's um, uh, a, a sweet little girl, not more than 90 pounds. Like, uh, and Hamer's just kind of like tearing apart this uh, guy's, um, this guy's image that he had built up about Bonnie Parker as kind of this sweet Texas uh, girl with a good yeah. with a good heart, and you know she has uh, she's beautiful, uh, and he basically says, "No, they're demonic. They're evil now." Yeah, 
Yeah. Oh, just just as a little side point, Kevin Costner and this movie looks like the I the, the exact same as my dad does now. <laughs> he's, he's always, my dad looks a lot like Kevin Costner, and uh, in this movie, like old Kevin Costner, it's uh, he looks almost the, the, the same as my dad. It's really quite weird. Just a just a little something for the chat there. It's, a, it's a, I couldn't help but think realize it when I was watching this. Uh, and the the other important factor in the movie is the theme of the media. So I'd say yeah. that. Um, I'd say that the, the first Bonnie and Clyde movie, that is Bonnie and Clyde from the perspective of the media. So that like is the movie from the media. But then in this movie, it's not uh, like the, the media is an element in the movie. So one thing, there's different things that you see. So there's, uh, they notice that different girls are now starting to dress like Bonnie Parker. So there's the famous photos of her posing with uh, cigars and uh, a revolver. And she's wearing this black beret. And uh, one thing they notice when they're in that town is that every uh, like all these young girls on the street are now wearing this black beret. They're trying to dress like Bonnie Parker, and uh, they go into this bar and these these guys uh, attack Galt because um, he they know he's going after the, the two of them. They say Clyde is king. I I absolutely love the scene where, where he shoves the, he shoves the guy's head in the toilet and he says Clyde might be king, but I'm a, but I'm a Texas Ranger, you little shit. It's really good, but it, I mean, one thing one thing that's so interesting is just uh, the the media's ability to uh, to create a reality which people uh, which people live in rather than the actual real world. I talked about this in my recent video, but this might be a um, a more early example of something that is much more damaging to us today. But just the the media's ability to create narratives and to create these folk tales about um, things, and you know, and many times. What I've said on my channel before is that they very often uh, make evil out to be good and good out to be evil. Yeah, absolutely. You see, again and again throughout the movie, you've got Hema. Um, he sees the reality. He sees uh, the cop who's had his brains blown out, or the guy at the gas station who's been shot, you know, for, for four dollars. He sees all of that. But then he he sees that the media is portraying Bonnie and Clyde as being heroes, and everybody's going along with it. And and the the scene at the end, so they 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 get riddled with bullets, and then they they they, they drag the car into um, the tow the car into the local town, and you can see there's, there's like thousands of people out, and and they, it turns out, and this is real, this really happened as well where people are trying to get a uh, clip off Bonnie's hair. And there was even somebody trying to cut off Clyde's ear as a souvenir of, of, of and the, as, as heroes as well. It wasn't like these, they were these huge things, these huge monsters, which had been conquered. They, they were heroes. And so it really makes the normies out to look like complete morons, like easily manipulated morons. And in the end, um, I think it's like the last scene, Hema is contacted by a journalist. Like, do you want to have an interview? And it's it's as if it's like, well, we need a new narrative to run with now, and you're it. And he just shakes his head and walks away. And again, he did that in in real life. He was a very quiet man. He didn't. He liked his own company. Yeah, and I think that uh, maybe the on a deeper level, the the film, The Highwayman, it is a critique of media. Because as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, actually, you might have said this off air, I can't remember, but uh, it's an absolute travesty that um, Frank Hamer, the best thing he's known for is hunting down Bonnie and Clyde. And when in reality, his life story is actually probably a lot more interesting. Uh, and like, who's been made into a American icon? It's, uh, the, it's the criminals when in rea when reality, you could make a lot more <laughs> interesting movies about, uh, Fra about Frank Hamer alone, even from before he uh, was put on the case to hunt them down. Uh, you know, I guess you could say it says a lot about media over the last hundred years that, you know, someone like that has kind of just been shelved completely uh, from history up until this movie, which I think maybe was, uh, I, I guess, you know, the director, the director, he's he's based, I think uh, he's uh, he's from Texas himself. He's the same guy that made um, the movie The Founder about the guy who started McDonald's. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that it's kind of his way of shooting back at uh, media over the last kind of hundred years and making out the uh, making the villains into the heroes and the heroes into the villains. And that's kind of what he does with this entire movie.
the, the story, they tell a story about uh, like Mexican, there's a special sort of Spanish name for it. I don't know what it was, but they're, basically it's a bunch of Mexicans, um, like a militia or something, which are going to come across the border. And they are, this is in, in Hema's uh, early days. And they keep shooting the people who are trying to get them to chat. Now, I watched the documentary today, which was a bit of one of those old documentaries. And, and then it, what happens is they, they sneak into the camp and they shoot 50 of them, as of the Mexicans, as they're, they're lying there sleeping. Now, in this documentary, um, which was an old one that I watched, and the, that was true. What's told in the film is true. But on top of that, the Mexicans had said they were going to go into Texas and kill every white person male above 16 years of age and retake texas so the, the, this is like all going on on the on the the this kind of terrorism is was playing out on the on the border and frank came as they're sneaking into their camp in the middle of the night and just killing them all 50 men in one night it's it's really it's really quite something and he the the he did he had like 16 bullets in him and he was covered in scars and everything you could make you could make a whole series of movies about his life, and yet he like so in Hollywood, he's just like this clown that needs to be mocked like that. It's 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 disgraceful. Yeah, and I love the scene when there it's before uh, the the ambush. It's the night before the ambush, and it's actually Galt who's telling the story about uh, Hamer, about Hamer, and uh, they were. They noticed every time they went into this this camp of Mexicans, they tried to ambush them, but they would always yell out first, hands up, and then the Mexicans would just start shooting and they'd lose an officer and it never worked. Uh, they yelled hands hands up in Spanish. I can't remember what it was exactly, but Hamer said, okay, we're going to go in and we're not yelling hands up. We're just going to shoot them. And then they go in the next night and they just, and they just shoot all, they just shoot all 50 of them. Uh, and um, and then, then that, that actually works. That's how they actually defeat them. It kind of is a. It kind of says a lot about the. Um, I, I, I guess you could say the the code of honor of um, you know of, of the uh, that that you'd, you'd expect like in a, in a kind of liberal society that the criminal has rights, so you need to uh, give them the opportunity to, to surrender before uh, you shoot them. Uh, that that's kind of what stops them from actually defeating the, defeating evil at one at uh, at any point. So it, it kind of lets the criminal win. Uh, and the difference is like Galt, he like is retelling this story. He's saying like he has these whole, these nightmares about these screaming Mexicans that they shot. He says he accidentally shot a, a kid, whereas Hamer, like it's all just like, uh, you know, he, he did what he needed to do to, to stop evil. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I wanted to add as well is that the, when we actually get to see uh, Bonnie and Clyde, they, 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 they look like really cheap, like B grade actors as well. You get like a you get a close up of them just for a few seconds in their car as they're as they're about to be mown down, and they really look like they've come from some horrible kind of soap opera from some crap TV show nobody watches. Um, they they just look like the most cheapest terrible actors they could get, and I cannot help but think that was on purpose, like that was deliberate. To, to where they, there's just nothing glamorous about them. Even even the actors that they've got to portray them can't even do it properly. It's as if this this whole production has got nothing but contempt for Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, and I think that I love the ambush scene at the end. It's it's good in every rendition of Bonnie and Clyde, but it's also great in The Highwaymen. So uh, they basically, what, what they did was they, uh, one of the members of the gang, uh, his name was Methvin, I think, uh, what they said to his father is that, okay, we're going to not prosecute your son for the murder of these two officers. He's still going to face other charges, but he won't face the death penalty if you help us set up this ambush. So this is, they were staying at his house uh, and like he he used his uh, traditional wisdom to figure this out. Like the, the what he said earlier is that the horses always come home in Texas. He knew that Bonnie and Clyde would go back home because their mothers, their, their mother, uh, her mother and his parents lived in Dallas uh, well, what he what he then figured out is Methvin, the guy that they were traveling with. He his father lived in Louisiana, and he knew that they were going to go back to Louisiana at one point. It turns out that they were uh, hiding out at his place. So what they what they did was they um, they gave this deal to the to his father that you know he would uh, help them set up this ambush. He'll once his son gets away, he he won't uh, they won't prosecute him for murder. He, they won't kill him in this ambush. 
but he'll put his car- truck on the side of the road. He'll remove one of the wheels. Then Clyde will slow down and stop. And that's when they're going to jump out of the bush and shoot them to death. Uh, the six officers uh, waiting in the bush, Hamer, Galt, and his uh, posse. So um, the scene is absolutely bonkers. I, I I love this scene in basically every rendition, but I'd say that in this one, definitely that one scene captures all of Frank Hamer in that one scene. It's just basically uh, hard, rock hard justice, just ripping through liberalism and all of all these roadblocks in the way to just kind of punch evil right in the face. And uh, yeah, it's a, a great scene. Uh, and it's, you know, it was probably like that in real life. I mean, they fired uh, 130 rounds into that car. I mean, that would have just been absolutely bonkers. But, you know, it really does capture Frank Hamer, that one scene. They they eat the car so they're, they're dead. And then Clyde's sort of, you know, obviously his foot comes off the, the pedal and the car rolls down. And then they, they fire like a few more pot shots into the car just to make sure. They've already, they've already fired like 100 and odd rounds into the car. They're obviously, they've been blown to pieces. And then the car <laughs> trundles past them, and it's like, let's just get another couple in there, just to make it, just to be absolutely sure that these sons of bitches are put down for good. And I guess the ultimate uh, message of the movie would be the, and which is you know deeply reactionary, is that it, you need that sort of justice to defeat evil. You know, you can think about this all like uh, this shades of gray, you know, were they the, these victims of the system? You know, Clyde uh, said that he's, his motivation was getting revenge for the treatment that he received when he was in prison in Texas. Uh, they don't think, I don't think they address, address that in either of the films, but uh, that was his main motivation was just uh, payback against the prison system. But what, what this film basically says is just like, screw all that. We need to just go, go all out and, you know, justice just needs to slay evil. And that's the only way for good to win. Mm. And, I, and I think so. Something kind of just to, to wrap up. It's a bit of a can of yeah. worms. But what I what I think is interesting when I look at some of the the movies we've done and some of the ones that I've done on my channel is that um, the there's a kind of there's a kind of reactionary movie, but it can be from like almost from the left. So if you look at the, say, I'd say Bonnie and Clyde is similar to Easy Rider or um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. They all come out within a couple of years of each other and they're all uh, a sort of uh, progressive kind of reaction against the authority. But what's weird is that you when, when we were looking at, say, Once Upon a Time in the West, or as I did on my channel, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, they are similar in scope. So, like, say, um, Billy the Kid in, part, in Sam Peckinpah's, who's a, like a right-wing uh, director, he, he, Billy the Kid laments the, that the, the modern world is coming, and he wants to get away from it. And this, it's a similar theme as what we got into on Once Upon a Time in the West. So it's, it's, it's really like, what is the difference then? Because in, in the, the right wing case, it's kind of getting away from the modern world and the left are trying to get away from authority or something. What would you say about that? Uh, so as in, what's the difference between uh, escaping the modern world and escaping authority? Yeah, well, I'm, what, I'm just, I'm just, it, it's because the, there's movies which are similar and they're, 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 they're almost all American Westerns as well. But you, you, you can say that something like, um, you, you, somebody in the distant right would have some sympathy for characters in something like the uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid because Billy the Kid laments the ending of the Wild West and everything is being turned into a business. Everything is being, uh, you've got the train lines coming in from all over and there's fences going up. So there's there's a kind of old life which is being erased by modernity. The same theme plays out in um, Once Upon a Time in the West. But th- then when you look at, if you look at, uh, say, Bonnie and Clyde, what are they doing? They, they too are in rebellion against the modern world, but from a leftward direction. And I think that's a, it's a really interesting to think about what the differences are. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I do. I guess what my answer to that would be is that I don't think all authority is illegitimate. So even before modern times, there still was the king. The, the king was an authority. The king had power. 
you couldn't just do whatever you want. But ultimately that it was a, it was a order, which was just, there was a natural order. And I think that someone can have the feeling of freedom that they're not being imposed upon, that they don't have the, the modern world just like imposing itself upon you, but still you, you, you can live under an, a natural order. You still will have authority, but it, it'll be one that actually respects, you know, your ability to live kind of an authentic life without the, uh, I guess, I guess without the soul crushing force of modernity, just leaning against you. I think uh, I think uh, capitalism has a lot to do with it because I think the 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 right conservative right became synonymous with capitalism and then it became uh, synonymous with that power structure and so when once that took hold um, then re rebellion against that would have to come from the left and but if you go back to an earlier version of an earlier incarnation like say um some of the themes in the other westerns like i mentioned before it's they are not it's not it, it's as if capitalism is coming and absorbing them into it i think it's i mean it's something that i only just considered before when i was walking the dog but i think i think it's really fascinating to ask yourself like what is the difference in the end and i think the difference is that the the the, the capitalist superstructure became in america thought of as 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 right wing as so you do get the patriarchy and the kind of 2.4 kids and all of this kind of thing and th this becomes society's norm rather than um living in like the the trad life out on the steps somewhere and being kind of angry that trains and uh, businesses were arriving and turning everything into a market a market economy if, or something like that yeah, I definitely say that there's a reason for optimism that that's kind of no longer going to be a right wing view. Uh, I mean, you know, in the era of woke capital, I think that that's kind of you're trying kind of switching uh, positions again, whereas the left, I mean, they won't no left is going to say this, but they really are the slaves of capital. Now they are the slaves of modernity. So that system that they used to critique as being oppressive, being exploitative. Well, you know, they are the uh, they are the child, the children of it now, and in many ways, they are the uh, foot soldiers of it. So there is going to, I think, there is kind of be this uh, reorganization, whereas you know that capitalist system used to be part of the right. I definitely don't think that that accurately describes the world today. Yes, and, and it means that the dissidents are, are going back into an older um, reactionary mode, which is on the outside of that, which is feeling it. Uh, the system encroach upon you. Whereas, say, if you go to uh, Bonnie and Clyde and the 60s, you know, all of those, you look, Easy Rider, again, it's it's about breaking out of the, the, the system, being in rebellion against authority and this, this capitalist pig system and all of that kind of thing. And that, now they are it. But the, the, it means that we are then on the outside of that um, critiquing modernity and they are in the inside but in the 60s it was the other way around that that's the the, the framing's completely changed yeah definitely uh you know i think um uh i mean even even today i don't want to get into this here but the system is now like imposing itself to such an extent that it's like gonna say uh, shortly that you're not allowed to enter a supermarket without it without it uh, imposing itself upon you. You're not going to be allowed to buy a banana without, you know, uh, t uh, passing a checkpoint of the system. And I guess that that would be the, um, I, I guess that, that, you know, the, the left is now kind of something that's in full support of that. And uh, the opposition that is increasingly coming from the right. So it's definitely a big, uh, a big uh, landslide there. Um, uh, one more thing I wanted to mention uh, before we, before we finished is that, um, you know, it, we, we mentioned that it's really interesting how um, Bonnie and Clyde are the uh, Bonnie and Clyde are kind of seen as these American folk heroes, and uh, Frank Hamer is someone who's completely forgotten. You know, I couldn't help but think of like uh, today, whereas you know, it's like completely, uh, it, it's completely obvious that to anyone who's just not like bought the mainstream media Kool Aid, but like someone uh, like George Floyd is upheld as this like saint today, and that's just a complete like media creation. Uh, you, you know, he's been made to, to be this hero by, by a media and like people actually buy it. One thing it just made me wonder was, um, you know, how much of our history is actually a result of that? How much is, it, how much of our history is actually the result of, 
over the last century of uh, media kind of creating our own consciousness and our own kind of perception of the um, various events that we uh, understand throughout our history and uh, just shifting that around. And, you know, the more you look into it, the more uh, glaring that actually is. Mm, absolutely. And I think one of the, one of the things, one of the, why it, it's so um, powerful and poignant when him at the end says he doesn't want anything to do with the media. He just walks away. And it's because you can see that he's, he's kind of, he's outside of that paradigm. Like he doesn't, in the end, he doesn't like them. He doesn't trust them, but he doesn't need them either. He doesn't need the, he doesn't need to be validated through the media in a way, which actually Bonnie and Clyde did. That's why Bonnie and Clyde did those photo shoots. They were playing up. They were playing up to the legend, you know. Um, they, 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 they like literally did photo shoots of themselves standing there with machine guns. And Hema is um, he, he he knows his own mind, and I think that's a much more healthy way to be and 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 world outlook to have. You don't need the adoration of all of those zombies that were swarming in the streets crying because two psychopaths had just been killed. He doesn't need any of that. He he's a, he's like he's like a, a legion of one. He knows his mind. He knows his own place in the world, and he doesn't need to be validated by the media. Um, and that's that's a very powerful thing, and it's admirable as well. Yeah, de yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, like you can think how how well that graphs on today. Today, you know, you'll get people like crowds in America burning down a town because some rapist with a knife was shot by a police officer. Um, but, you know, I think like one of my takeaways from that movie is just that like mass media in general is really just a cancer that uh, this kind of a uh, force that's able to create these uh, these various narratives and just build up almost anything and uh, turn people into these crazed maniacs uh, over any kind of narrative that they push out there. That really is just, a, 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 a I think, just a cancer in, in its own point. Uh, never mind who, you know, who owns it and the and the agendas they want to push. Um, I just think that's something that's bad for society as a whole. And <laughs> I mean, back then, it, back then was an early example, but it's basically destroying, it's destroying Western countries today. I'm, I'm happy I didn't get into it on this stream, but Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers is like a searing, absolutely psychedelic, insane send up of all of this, like the media sort of obsession with murderers and serial killers and it is it is like this kind of weird postmodern take on on Bonnie and Clyde which I think we we'll have to do and because that kind of stuff usually ends up my channel um I'll do it on my channel maybe after the next time or something but it, it, it's it's it that movie is so bad like uh, it's it's a great movie but it, it was it's so psychotic that it was banned in Britain in the 1990s. Cool. Um, it's and and weirdly enough, Woody Harrelson's in it as well. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's, another, there's actually another interesting uh, Bonnie and Clyde movie that came out in 2013. So this one is a bit more. Uh, I know that you haven't seen it, but I'll, I'll say a few things about it. Um, it is a lot more historically accurate than the original from the 60s. It gives a much more accurate um, timeline of their lives, and uh, it's 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 a lot more uh, it's a lot more forgiving to Frank Hamer than uh, the original one is. Uh, but I think what's good about that one is it actually does uh, portray uh, Bonnie Parker not really as like this uh, machine gun wielding maiden folk heroine, but really as this like uh, this like narcissistic psychopath. And kind of, and Clyde Barrow is more portrayed as not really this Robin Hood figure, but kind of just this small time thief. And their life is not really uh, seen quite as glamorous as it is in the 60s movie. It's just more kind of frantic and exhausting. So, you know, I'd say if, if you're looking for a, uh, a, a rendition uh, that's focused on Bonnie and Clyde, that one definitely is probably a, um, it might be a better overall film uh, in terms of like storytelling. But it's definitely not as interesting in terms of the themes is, as the 1960s one. Is William Hurt uh, Frank Gamer? I think so, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I'll give that a watch. Yeah, yeah that's a good one too. So uh, yeah, is there anything else you'd like to add on the two films before we finish? Not well, not really. There's, uh, there's, <laughs> there's, I think I, got, I covered uh, pretty much everything in my notes. But uh, there's, there's really, I think... I, I just I just think that it is fascinating to see the American myth, or uh, especially in the South, because 
in in the north where you've got you know these gangsters it's almost like they're not even american they they've, they've got their own networks they're ethnically they're just off the board and i think the the real spirit of, of the south and you know all these texas and all of this in in this era is is something i don't know it's something much more interesting i think There's oh yeah one thing I want I wanted to mention was I absolutely love the setting in these movies. I love the South in the '30s. It's just uh, beautiful. I, I I love the the, the culture, the um you know that the technology. It's not like everywhere, but it is like you know that these nice automobiles that still look classy. The guns and like uh, the, the Tommy guns. It's really cool. I love the setting. I, and just just that scene of of uh, Kevin Costner like sort of pottering around in his his garden. In his little his little white house, and he's he's at peace with the world, you know. And it, it's this this kind of thing where like you, we're gonna have to bring you back. We've got something for you to do. This this tragic kind of old wolf is gonna go out and hunt once again. I, I love that kind of thing. That was that was great stuff. Great stuff. That, it was definitely. So what I'd say what I'd recommend to people is that I'd say watch uh, the sixty seven one first. It's the classic one. It's the better known one. And then watch the Highway Men. After that, they contrast each other very well. Uh, I'm shocked that the Highway Men is, is a Netflix movie that came out in 2019. Uh, you know, you you, you have to ex, have to expect like Frank Hamer to be some like black lesbian or something like that. But no, it's completely free of any political correctness. Don't watch it on Netflix because don't pay for Netflix. But uh, you can find it online for free. And if you're looking for a link, uh, just message me and I can send one to you. So anything la last to say? Do you want to let everyone know if you've decided on what movie we're going to do next month? Well, I'm, I'm tempted to do Natural Born Killers now, but um, or what I had lined up was Planet of the Apes. So either Natural Born Killers or Planet of the Apes. I think Planet of the Apes. We'll leave, okay. we'll leave the serial killers for a while and come back to it. <laughs> okay. And, and, well, I, mean, I, mean, I mean the Charlton Heston Planet of the Apes as well. All right. So uh, I guess we'll be doing Planet of the Apes next month. All right, so uh, thanks for listening, everyone. I think this stream went very well, and we'll be back later. Have a good night. Right. See you later, folks.